Hello everyone, this is the historiographer. Today, we will explore the life and times of the man that has become a symbol of national resistance against colonialism and fascism, the man known as the Lion of the Desert and the leader of the Martyrs, a man who has forever ingrained his name in history due to his two decades long guerrilla resistance against Italian colonialism in Libya, therefore directly enraging Benito Mussolini himself. Meet Omar al Mukhtar. Despite the aforementioned setbacks in part 1, where the Ottomans surrendered Libya to Italy in 1912, thereby leaving al Mukhtar alone, Omar al Mukhtar remained in command of the fight against the Italians in the entirety of Cyrenaica and eastern Libya until the arrival of the Senussi leader Ahmed al Sharif al Senussi to the city of Derna in 1913. It was here that Omar al Mukhtar became the second in command to al Sharif. Al Sharif was an energetic man. Not only did he direct his fight against the Italians, but in 1915 he also attacked the British controlled Sultanate of Egypt due to Ottoman pressure, especially after the Ottoman Empire's invasion of Sinai. Ultimately, this signaled the start of the British campaign against the Senussis in World War I. Returning to the fight against Italy, the early years of the First World War were the most violent. Indeed, Senussi raids under Omar al Mukhtar focused on the Derna region in eastern Libya. During his raids against the Italians, Omar al Mukhtar constantly changed locations, moving mostly in his base of operations in the Green Mountain in Cyrenaica. In each raid, he used to take with him 100 to 300 men mounted on cavalry and armed with light rifles only to withdraw quickly. A skilled negotiator, Al Mukhtar consistently recruited from the tribes of eastern Libya. However, during this period, the Libyan resistance faced major setbacks due to the Italian takeover of most of the countryside in central and northern Cyrenaica by mid-1914 as part of their wider invasion of Libya. Nevertheless, the line of the desert remained steady and he continued to use his guerrilla warfare experience acquired in Chad and in Libya as well as his previous knowledge of the geography and desert, knowledge acquired in his university years in Jahbou. Italian soldiers who were not familiar with desert wars and were not accustomed to desert heat were somewhat easy prey to the lone fox. However, the knot increasingly tightened on the Senussis and Al Mukhtar, who were now boxed in more and more in eastern Libya not only by the Italian army, but also by the advancing British army due to the started war against Britain. Enter Idris al Senussi, who became the de facto leader of the movement in 1960. The new leader Idris, a pragmatic man, made an alliance with the British Empire, hence halting all attacks against territories in the British mandate over Egypt. With this alliance, Idris was able to use the British as intermediaries to broker negotiations with Italy. Indeed, by April 1916, the first negotiations with Rome took place. Crucially, however, one year later, the Akrama Agreement was signed. This agreement allowed both parties to coexist in peace. The Sanusi were also permitted to free trade with the coast and with Egypt, and Idris' rule was recognized in parts of southeastern Libya. In exchange, Idris was to renounce allegiance to the Ottoman Empire, release Italian POWs, cease hostilities against the Allies in Britain, as well as, crucially, to disband Sanusi forces. Naturally, the last clause angered the Libyan resistance under al Mukhtar who probably refused to comply with the orders of Idris. This is proven by the fact that Idris did not fulfill this last term, either due to his unwillingness to disband his forces or simply due to his inability to control his fighters. The reason is probably the latter, as Idris was even armed by Italy and Britain to contain Libyan resistance fighters. Post World War I, Italy was left in a fractured domestic landscape, mostly angered by what many Italians saw as a mutilated victory as Italy was not given all of its claims. As a result, Italy was in no shape for another military confrontation, giving rise to a lull in hostilities. For example, to ease tensions with Libyans, Italy issued major decrees in 1919. These decrees, known as Legge Fondamentale, or fundamental laws, brought about a compromise by which all Libyans were accorded the right to a joint Libyan-Italian citizenship and more autonomy to the provinces of Tripolitania and Cyrenaica. 
The Sanusi leader Idris was content with this arrangement and Idris even visited Rome as part of the celebration to mark the promulgation of the settlement. It is unknown what was the reaction of Al-Mukhtar to all of these political changes, but what is known is that Al-Mukhtar vehemently opposed the Al-Rajma Accord in 1920, which gave Idris the title of Emir of Cyrenaica in exchange for his full submission to Italy. Furthermore, Idris was once again ordered to disband the Sunusi army, but he did not comply, souring tensions between Idris and Rome. Certainly, the 1920 agreement infuriated Omar al-Mukhtar and the rest of the sheikhs and leaders who vowed to continue their jihad against Italy. To pressure Emir Idris, Libyan resistance leaders pledged allegiance to him as their leader on the sole condition that this allegiance is to be for jihad against the Italians only. Idris had no choice but to accept the Pledge of Allegiance. While the Emir was also made Emir of Tripolitania by request of Tripolitanian leaders in 1922, Idris feared that Italy, under its new fascist leader Benito Mussolini, would militarily retaliate against the Senussi order due to the order's growing power. Therefore, Idris went to exile in the newly established Kingdom of Egypt from which he would guide the Libyan resistance despite the previous rapprochement efforts. After the departure of Emir Idris, responsibility of the entire leadership fell on Omar al-Mukhtar. Truly, he became the leader of the jihadist movement in the Green Mountain region and began collecting money and weapons, inciting the tribes as well as presiding over the raids and attacks against the Italians in Cyrenaica. In March 1923, Al-Mukhtar traveled to Egypt to present to Emir Idris the result of his work, as well as to receive the necessary instructions, where he was able to cross the Egyptian border and meet with Idris in Cairo. It was in Cairo that Italian agents attempted to contact Omar Al-Mukhtar, where they offered to provide him amnesty and a luxurious salary in exchange of giving up arms. The Italians repeated their offer to Al-Mukhtar several times, even after his departure from Egypt and his return to Cyrenaica, but he refused each time and insisted on jihad to fight his homeland's occupiers. In any case, Al-Mukhtar had agreed with Emir Idris while he was in Egypt on the details of the plans that the Mujahideen should follow against the Italians. Further, it was agreed that from Egypt, money, arms and supplies would be sent to the Libyan resistance fighter. The Italians were following the movements of Omar al-Mukhtar and were waiting for the first opportunity to eliminate him to put down the revolution. During his return from Egypt to Cyrenaica by mid-1923, he and his companions passed by a place called Bir al-Ghabi. The Italians, however, were waiting for the now nearly 65-year-old fight where Italian armed vehicles attacked at the earliest opportunity and surrounded them. A firefight ensued, and all but one armored vehicle were immobilized. In the year 1923, after the Italian colony of Libya had lived for several years in relative calm with weakness in Italian control, the Italian government under the new leader slash dictator Benito Mussolini, a fascist-fueled hardliner, decided to radically change its policy towards Libya. Long were the days of Italian deals with the Sunusi. Instead, Mussolini declared that all deals were to be null and void and pursued a militaristic policy to crush all Libyan resistance. Truly, the period between 1924 and 1925 witnessed many skirmishes and bloody battles between the revolutionaries and the Italian forces, and the Mujahideen expanded their military activity in the Green Mountain. The name of Omar al-Mukhtar shown as a brilliant leader who mastered hit-and-run tactics and enjoyed great influence amongst the tribes. Indeed, the Bedouin tribesmen began to join the ranks of the Mujahideen in large numbers, and the tribes took the initiative to provide Libyan resistance with supplies, equipment, and weapons they needed, on top of the supplies arriving from Egypt. However, in 1924-25, the Italian governor of Cyrenaica, Ernesto Bombelli, pursued a new tactic of attacking and following Al-Mukhtar to his hideouts, resulting in huge setbacks for the Libyan resistance. Ever the flexible guerrilla, Mukhtar quickly modified his own tactics. Indeed, Al-Mukhtar undertook massive reorganization efforts. For example, Mukhtar organized a higher advisory council amongst Libyan resistance, headed by himself and including various sheikhs and notables 
of the tribes of eastern Libya. There was also a system of military ranks similar to the Ottoman one, which included promotions for those with outstanding achievements and deeds. These efforts resulted in containing the Italian wave, as the new Italian governor of Cyrenaica, Attilio Tiruti, appointed in 1926, acknowledged in his published memoirs titled Green Cyrenaica that the tactic of pursuing the rebels and continuously striking them in the Green Mountain had exhausted the Italian forces which made it an effectively useless method. This has been part 2 on the life and times of Omar al-Mukhtar, where we have explored the decade between the start of World War I until 1926. Join us next video as we will discover how Omar al-Mukhtar faced his final nemesis, General Rodolfo Graziani, as well as his trial and ultimate execution. If you like this video, consider subscribing to spread the fascinating history of Libya. This has been the historiographer and for now, see you on the next video.